Hi, welcome voice friends to another episode of Interviews on Voice Matters. I'm Liz Johnson Schaefer, and today we have Lynn Helding, who is the, an associate professor of voice and voice pedagogy at USC, uh, the Thornton School of Music. And she is also the creator and author of The Mindful Voice, which is a regularly occurring column in the Journal of Singing. And on top of all of that, she was elected to head the founding of the Pan American Vocology Association. And I couldn't be more thrilled to have her here with us. So thank you so much, Lynn, for taking the time to talk with us today. Sure. Great. Happy to be here, Liz. Wonderful. Um, so I kind of want to just jump in and, and find out how you came to vocology. Why voice science, Lynn? Oh boy. I think uh, like many people, I was always curious about the way the voice worked. Um, I was also very physically active throughout my childhood and early adolescence. So for me, singing was always kind of a full body sport and I wanted to understand it. Um, like I think many singers, um, I had a variety of teachers. My first teacher was excellent, was not at all versed in science, but was nevertheless excellent. I got a great grounding. But after I left her, um, things went downhill. Uh, I had some, I'm just going to say it, very bad teaching, um, very uh, in short order after that. And it just compelled me to want to find out more. I realized I wanted to find out how this thing worked and how I could protect myself and how I could make better choices about who I was going to work with. And there wasn't a lot available at that time. So uh, I took uh, some time off. I went to Italy, I lived there for a year, um, came back. And by that time, the next important person, singer, teacher in my life um, had, uh, arrived let's say and that was Dale Moore at Indiana University so I studied with him and that was the same year that Richard Miller's book uh, came out so that kind of dates me but he uh, he just he held up the book and he said do you have this book and I said no and he said go buy it because this is what we're doing <laughs> I said okay so it was great I I that was I was hooked I totally fell in love with it and basically ever after just pursued everything I could in terms of um, summer workshops or anything that was going on where I could learn more. Yeah, that's a common theme with a lot of folks yes, it is. In, in voice science. So I love to hear that. Um, so how did you, or what graduate school did you go to? I don't know that. Indiana. Okay, yeah. Indiana. Okay, so yeah. this is. And then I did in my pedagogy degree at Westminster Choir College, where I worked with Scott McCoy and Chris Arneson. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was later. That was really after there was a pedagogy program that actually included voice science because that, you know, that was another thing that really just didn't exist. And it's still, you know, a bit challenging, I think, to find. Um, there certainly are programs, um, and I'm not going to name them all because I, <laughs> I just don't want to go there. But, uh, you know, there are a handful, I would say, that really are inculcating the voice science in the curriculum. Um, but there are still quite a few that don't and are operating on the old model. Um, I'm still surprised to find that, especially when I interview my master's degree students who take my foundations in vocology course here at UC, USC. Um, I want to know what their undergrad experience was because I don't want to talk down to them. But I've been pretty shocked to discover that most, and I'm talking over 90%, that is, that is, that is true, uh, are reporting to me that their pedagogy classes, that's what they're called, uh, at the undergraduate level are exactly the same kind of model that I had back in the Stone Age, uh, which is basically someone on the faculty teaching a class in which they, might read or might not read articles. They discuss various topics of technique, but everyone's always a little afraid to do that because they don't want to step on other teachers' toes. So um, that's one of the things that I think science affords us. I know we're going to talk about this a little more, but it, uh, it affords that objective lens. 
So, uh, so I was really shocked to discover that. And um, even though I think things are changing, I, I think there's a lot more room. And I'm really hopeful that the next generation of singers and students who are graduating will be in that vanguard. And that, you know, within a decade, it will just be de rigueur everywhere across the country. So the new model of teaching pedagogy is going to have specific courses in vocology. Is that what you're saying? Well, I think the new model just needs to take advantage of the science. So if we yeah. say uh, that voice science has historically been comprised of physiology and acoustics. So a quick timeline would be physiology, which comes in in the actually the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, and then the early 20th, you quickly see the addition of um, doctors, physicians. Uh, James Stark wrote about that in his book, Bel Canto, which is a really important historical document of what he calls the laryngologist voice teachers <laughs> mm. who uh, came in with their expertise. And then there's a hiatus. Um, and as I teach my students, there were these two little things called World War I and World War II, <laughs> which blasted the smithereens out of everything. And when we finally came to our senses in the 1950s, then you again start to see this burgeoning voice science through uh, people like Ralph Appleman at Indiana and also William Bernard here at USC, uh, pioneers in voice science. So that, that's kind of the beginning of, I think, where we are now, that lineage. Um, Miller in the 1980s, as in Richard at Oberlin, some of these people uh, forwarded that knowledge. And then you see the acoustics part of it coming in through uh, Johann Sundberg and Ingo Tietze, and that takes us really up to now. Uh, because that's fairly new information. And as always with science, it takes a long time for scientific information to trickle down to the common population. Um, and I would include, absolutely include singers in that. And I think that's a, a real missing piece is um, getting that information to the people who most use it and most need it. And that would be singers themselves and their teachers. Uh, so that's kind of where my work came in. Um, I, I was very influenced by the work of Kitty Verlini. Mm -hmm. I was really fortunate to study with her at Summer Vocology Institute the years I spent two summers there um, with Ingo, uh, Kitty and others. And Kitty's work in motor learning theory was, that was what really ignited me and got me thinking that there was something missing. So in my writing, I proposed the missing brain as in cognitive science, because at that point we had physiology function, albeit seen through a, a, the lens of medical science, which I would love to talk about a little more. Uh, and then we have acoustics, um, which really comes through communications and has a long history back to World War II, actually, speaking of, um, in terms of all of the apparatus that was used for communication and spying in World War II, all of that stuff that left over. Detritus had to have somewhere to live, and so it came in and ended up in the land-grant universities, particularly Iowa, Indiana, Illinois. That's why they have such big communication schools, because um, they were the recipients of a lot of that stuff and, and knowledge. So um, I think now, now that we're in the 21st century, it's really important to think about all of this accumulation of knowledge, which happened and was happening. And then we have digital, the digital revolution, which kind of lights a match and the whole thing just explodes in a good way. Mm -hmm. There's so much information out there. How do we parse it? How do we, how do we organize it? How do we make sense of it? And that's where the cognitive revolution comes in. Now, the cognitive revolution really in science dates also back to the 1950s. Um, but it wasn't until the 1990s that the common population became aware of all of the amazing research that was being done. So, you know, that's 40, 50 years it takes to trickle down 
right? And now you find people, I mean, you can read about it in People Magazine, the amazing things the brain does. So I proposed that we needed to stop doing what I call the doctrine of accumulation, which is accumulating knowledge with the idea that the more you know, the better you can sing, which isn't necessarily true. Um, it can be true, but what's more important is not necessarily what you know, but how you know what you know and how you can train other people. So I propose a shift in pedagogy to uh, focusing less on what teachers know and focusing more on how well students can learn and that if you put that lens on it changes everything because instead of an accumulator of knowledge you become a translator of knowledge wow. and in doing so i think i just wrote an article about this but i think part of the challenge in pedagogy right now is that most people get it with the physiology. It makes sense to them. Um, but the acoustics piece is much more difficult. Why? It's just more difficult information. Um, as one of my friends years ago said, is this like the physics of sound? And I said, yes, indeed it is. Yes. <laughs> um, so, and you know, once you get into that world, it's, uh, it's pretty mind blowing. It can be really difficult, it can be challenging. And I love to joke, oh, we're singers, we don't do math. Um, <clears throat> some people don't, but I don't think that that's always the most beneficial way to understand it. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested in finding metaphor, using metaphor for people to understand, using stories, using examples for people to understand it, rather than always just throwing up a computer voice analysis and making people uh, look at it through that lens. I think that can be really overwhelming. Um, unfortunately, it can also be very off-putting. And so I think that's why a lot of singers and teaching singer, uh, what am I trying to say, teachers of singing, have just rejected it. Not because they're against it per se, but because it's so off-putting to try to find an entry point in. And that was a common co uh, comment I was hearing a lot um, in the early days, in the sort of early days of my professional life, going to conferences and just overhearing these conversations. And I always thought that the most important ones were happening afterwards, during lunch, during the cocktail hour, after, during dinner, in the hallway, you know. And yet, um, people weren't always willing to be as open, you know, about their uh, their concern about not being able to get in you know how do i how do i find a way in especially if you have had training as an artist and um your last known science and math classes were you know in high school that's that can be a 20 or 30 year spread for a lot of people as it was for me right and i you've kind of answered this in many ways but the question is, why does it matter that we have vocology for average singers? No, I think uh, I think it's great. I think so. I think you'll you will find, and you probably already have gotten a lot of good answers to that question on your uh, your video series. Let's call it. Um, so I would take a different tack. I mean, obviously, you know, it's important, but again there is this supposition that the more you know, the better you can teach or the better you can sing. And I challenge that. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, I've witnessed that firsthand. So it isn't what you know, it's how you know what you know mm -hmm. and how that translates to your own singing and how well you can inculcate that in the throat of another person. Right. And so, I don't think that, I mean, obviously there is, the blessing of vocology is that there's information and it's available and people are learning it, yay. What I'm also interested in though is uh, the, first of all, the definition of the word I think is important. Um, ology simply means the study of something. Mm -hmm. 
So if we have musicology, we should have vocology. And this is very important. Vocology as a word then allows art in. It allows the humanities in. It's no longer just a science. It is everything can fit under that umbrella. And without the, what I would call the mediating effects of the humanities, we don't have an ology. So science gives us facts, but humanities translates the facts. Mm -hmm. Humanities helps us understand why it's important, mm -hmm. right? So it's really critical that we keep this huge umbrella term, I think, and that we start to uh, encourage more artists back under that umbrella. Um, and that's going to happen through the work of what I would call the translators, the people who are really interested in bringing this information. So the work that Laurel Mahaffey and David Harris are doing is really important. Um, we need much more of that. Um, and that's a way in that I think once people's interest is peaked, they'll find their way to the more difficult way of understanding, particularly acoustics. So it's a way to start from the bottom and grow up rather than top down, which is a much more organic way. Uh, and it also allows people to grapple with things as they are able to, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just slamming them over the head with really mind blowing, difficult information that mostly causes people to back off instead of say, oh, this is interesting, tell me a little more. Right, and that's what I found in my practice too, is that just a little bit of knowledge helps people to understand. And then they feel like what we're doing is more grounded and comprehensible and it helps them to reproduce it on the back end. Not that I need to slam them over the head with a, you know acoustic knowledge like you're talking about, but just introducing a couple laryngeal concepts or how muscles are working. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, and then we can relax together, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really important point, too. Um, I teach teachers here. Mm -hmm. So we have the foundations in vocology, but we also have a pedagogy practicum where then we use all that knowledge. And I am really trying to help them understand that, first of all, I don't think that teachers or singers can take a free pass. Mm -hmm. I think we have to know the science. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any way around that. But at the end of the day, what you choose to, how you choose to unravel that and let your students in on what you're doing is a very different ball game. And I've had people um, take classes with me or hear me talk in a conference setting, but in the studio, it's, it's different, it's quite different. It's much more like the old fashioned voice lesson. You know, and if I have to stop, I will sometimes even say, you know, let's take a moment for science, you know, and I'll, because they want to know. Um, they want to know, well, why is, why is this working? Um, so I do explain, but only insofar as we need to, to keep going. Because I also think it's important for people to stay in their bodies, to stay kinesthetically connected and not get too much in their heads. Yeah. So, um, that's a tricky place. Uh, for some people who are very smart with these science-y concepts, um, sometimes they want to go there, you know, instead of stay in the moment and stay in their bodies yeah. and stay in the creative place. And so that's my job in the studio. My job in the classroom is quite different. So I'm sort of living that, uh, the dichotomy between science and art all the time in my own work. Wow, that is the most clearly articulated way of speaking of that, that I've ever heard. So oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was wonderful. So um, as a creator uh, and author of The Mindful Voice, which by the way, when I open a journal of singing, that's pretty much the first thing I always go to because when I think of the word mindful, I think, ah, we can be present together. We can actually, you know, talk about some things and, and, and share. Um, how, do, what was the inspiration for that, for that column series that you do? Oh, uh, pretty simple, actually. I, I just felt that it was a huge gaping hole. I, I, there was nothing uh, about cognitive science. There was very little. Uh, once in a while, you'd see a psychology article, but, you know, not much. And so, oh, gosh, I'm trying to even remember what year it was. I know that it was at the Nashville Mats conference, whatever year that was. And I 
uh, Dick Jerdsma had recently become the editor in chief and was holding an open forum for the first time, I think, which I, yes. So I went to that and I asked why there, this wasn't being addressed. I felt that it was a huge topic that wasn't being covered. And so he approached me, uh, what you're what, asking? Well, I was going to say, what is, what do you mean by this? Just for people. Cognitive science. So it's specifically cognitive science focused. Oh yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure. Yeah. That's in, uh, I mean, if you actually read somewhere in the journal of singing, we are supposed to have a little clip about what our columns are about. Mm -hmm. Pedagogy column, there's the medical column. So my column is the cognitive, neuro, and social sciences as they relate to singing and teaching of singing. Okay, great. I just want to make that clear. So anything that's sort of in the realm of psychology uh, fall under that rubric. Okay. Brain science. Um, so I just, you know, this was the 1990s was the decade of the brain. You know, a lot of people missed that, but that's what it was declared. And I just thought it was a huge gaping hole. And so immediately after that, uh, Dick came up to me and said, would you like to write that column? And I went, oh, sure. <laughs> Why not? Uh, so that's how that started. And I was very passionate and still am uh, that it also be the forum for other authors and not just me um which has not happened as much as i would like it to frankly mm -hmm. um i think it's uh so any budding authors out there send me your stuff um on the other hand it's also been very important um i just actually finished editing a guest uh submission last night it's on my mind um when people are motivated to write articles, they're often motivated the same way they are motivated to fill out surveys. And that is when they're upset about something or they have a bone to pick about something. And that's just often more of a motivator than I have something wonderful to share, which is kind of sad, but true if you ask people who do surveys for a living. And I've noticed after being on the editorial board for many years that submissions often come in like that and you tell people how are they riled up about something. And as I said to this guest uh, in my comments, um, you know, the basic premise of this particular article was flawed because there was no proof. So we have to, all, so again, it's science to the rescue. You know, if we're going to make an assertion that nobody does X, or everybody says why, show me the proof. Because we're not sitting around my dining room table having dinner and a glass of wine and saying, oh, everybody says that and nobody does that. That's different, we can do that as friends and colleagues. But the minute that we put it into a professional arena and uh, particularly if it's going to be in print, it needs to be substantiated. You need, you know, show me the proof and then we'll go from there. So that's, I think one of the reasons that the column hasn't had as many other voices as I would like, um, and also because psychology, sometimes called the soft science, kind of lends itself to much more, shall we say, interpretation rather than quantitative data, um, which is fine. Qualitative is really, really important. So I would like to see more people exploring and investigating all of these topics. How, how do we learn? How do we learn um, muscular tasks? What's going on in your mind when you're singing? What about hearing? What about hearing and perception of self and others? Um, what about mindful practices you were saying earlier? Uh, one of my guest authors um, is really interested in yoga as am I, as a mindful body practice. Um, and both of us have talked about how enormously helpful it's been to our own singing. Um, so then there are a lot of ways to, to contribute to this part of the work that we're doing at the Journal of Singing. And I would like to see more people do it, but it can't be, um, it can't, it's not opinion based. That was one of the things I was pretty adamant about when I first started constructing this column uh, with Dick's help was that it not be opinion, 
that it be backed up by whatever science we have at the moment. Science is always a moving target as well. Yeah, that's wonderful. I've, I've, like I said, I've enjoyed it so much. And um, like I told you before we started the interview, I happened to be perusing some of your articles and I picked up this particular one. I know it's hard to see maybe, but this is ah. Professionalism of Voice. And this is from uh, May and June the May, June um, edition of 2013 or from 2013. And if you don't mind me, um, I would like to read the very last paragraph because it's interesting and I think it ties into the whole PAVA converse, conversation and how that goes. This last paragraph says, it is hoped that the body of voice professionals may collectively hurdle over similar tiresome debates about terminology, education, training, and licensure and consider recent sociological research on professionalism professionalism itself so that we might combine it with our own collective wisdom for the betterment of the field in all its iterations, voice research, voice health, and vocal art. And that just, it, that speaks to so many things. Um, but I would love to hear you talk about your impetus for writing this particular article and how that ties in with vocology and PAVA maybe. <laughs> wow. Um... I know it's a lot. No, it's not. What's interesting is that you sort of hit the mother load there. So uh, that was, the publication was May, June, right? You said yeah, 2013. 2013. Um, well, April of 2013 was the Specialty Training in Vocal Health, STVH, yeah. symposium that was held in Salt Lake City in 2013. And that is the conference that gave birth to PAVA. Mm. So that article was actually the keynote address that I gave at that conference. And that conference came about because of what I was referencing earlier of all these conversations that were happening in hallways yeah. <laughs> at other conferences and a lot of talk about certification, about people wanting to be recognized for having taken extra courses in speech language pathology and or voice science that don't necessarily carry licensure, but they want to be recognized for it. So finally, in 2013, uh, Eric Hunter um, was the big mover, I think, behind that converse, conference. Uh, I shouldn't call it a conference. It was a symposium. Uh, that was also sponsored by NCVS, National Center for Voice and Speech. And so many people came together and I gave one of the keynotes, which was on, and you, it, the actual title is the professionalization, because professionalization, and it's important, as a verb, uh, is really the process of how a body of knowledge comes together and how they become an association and why. Mm. And so I thought it was really important uh, to look at that through a historical lens. So that was my, my research for the keynote. Um, and often, of course, research is that I do for things end up as columns because that's just how the work happens. Um, so the talk that I gave was really about the history of professionalization. And it really starts in the early 20th century, especially with uh, the medical field and the dental field. Uh, two fields that were rife with hucksters and um, oh yeah if you go back and look it's really scary you know snake oil salesmen that's that what that comes from yeah. um, and so uh, uh, people and we, we must say at this juncture men because they were almost all men uh, in America was really the hotbed of professionalization. It was this era of um, the learned men in any knowledge base uh, decided to come together and create gates, create parents. So that's another where we get the word gatekeepers is this idea of people circling the wagons around a body of knowledge and deciding what their professional standards are. We might say, what is your scope of practice, right? That's a that's a, something we've learned from our medical colleagues. This idea of I am 
uh, qualified and in medical field, you know, licensed and certified to do X, Y, and Z, but I am not licensed and certified to do A, B, C. So this is my scope of practice. And all of these associations, there was a huge burgeoning of them in the early 20th century before World War I. That's when you have the greatest number happening. And uh, Nats was right in there for the same reasons. And there's uh, some very interesting history, which I reference in the article about real knockdown drag out fights and things people were saying about and to each other. Um, it's pretty interesting stuff. But um, at that conference, uh, the idea for PAVA was born. And in fact, um, we took a vote right then and there to, 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 start, to start it. And, um, so I think that's that's a little bit of um, an interesting tie into the article you happen to pick up <laughs> off the shelf is like the one that is tied to our birth date. Right. And that's all actually available as public record. You might want to know that's uh, still posted on the NCBS website is the proceedings from that symposium. So um, Lynn Maxfield did an amazing job of going back through the notes from that two-day symposium and putting it all together into a conference report. And this also brings me to another passion of mine, which is history. Um, we, we really need to stay on top of our own history, uh, the pedagogical history. And keep in mind that many things that we think are brand new knowledge are not. <laughs> you know, SOVTs, they've been known about for hundreds of years, but we just didn't call them SOVTs, semi-occluded vocal tract exercises, and we certainly didn't know anything about inertive reactants. So again, thanks to the work of Ingo Tietze, we now understand from a physiological and acoustic perspective what's happening why these exercises work so well, but um, teachers for hundreds of years have known that there was something about humming, for example, that seemed to free up the throat and make the vibrations come out more easily. Um, and so I would give a shout out to a very important colleague of ours, Stephen Austin, mm. who's just written a new book uh, through this historical lens, it's basically the compilation of his years of writing provenance, which is his column in the Journal of Singing. And that was exactly the point of the column, was to go back and look at the old historical treatises on singing and tie them together with current science knowledge. Mm. So it's really important that we not think that suddenly everything's brand new. It, right. This knowledge has been around for a, a long, not all of it, but many things, many uh, concepts through experience, through experiential learning, we might call it. Um, and there are still a number of people who disavow the science because of this more experiential nature. They find that it makes more sense to them. It's more tactile and therefore more real and not as theoretical. Right, right. And going back to the idea of professionalization, I mm -hmm. apologize for getting that wrong earlier. Um, <laughs> no, it's fine. It's just an interesting <laughs> difference, right, between oh. professionalism and Asian, which really means the making of something, you know, into, right. into a body. Right, which brings me to my next question. Like, um, one of the things that really astounded me at the Greensboro Pava Conference was um, Amelia Rawlings, or Rollins' uh, presentation on the history of certification in our field. The bottom line being we've tried, or people have tried for a long, long time. I don't know how many years exactly, but many, many years, probably a hundred. Yeah, because it goes back to the founding of NATS. That, that's what I reference in that article. Okay. Uh, is the founding and the people yelling at each other and saying we need to create some kind of an association that is hard to get into, and we will be the judge of that. And the, we will therefore, you know, for better or worse, certify we're going to give you the good housekeeping seal of approval. So, yes, it goes back 100 years for sure. Yeah. Um, that the fact that that has been 
it hasn't happened in so long um, just really rocked my world because you know I want to be as professional as I can and I'm sure most voice teachers want to have some kind of they would love to have some kind of credential or certification to like have something to go for or, or um, a kind of a benchmark to to get to or a way to learn um, and also to legitimize who they are as teachers do you feel that in the near future if we can get to some kind of certification process through pava or nats or whoever picks up the the torch um, do you think that that is going to be a helpful thing for our field oh that's a big question um so i'm gonna dodge it okay <laughs> totally <laughs> fine uh, only because only because um there has already been um, a committee that looked at this. And I think the first place to start to answer that question is that anyone who cares about this issue and certainly PAVA members need to read the report. The report is posted on the PAVA website. It's been there since they issued it, which was, I believe, in time for the Greensboro meeting. Um, so it's been there for whatever that is now, a year, more than a year. Um, and yet, having this conversation with people who, about certification, I'm shocked <laughs> to find people who haven't read the report. So that's kind of step one. So I'm not dodging it, I'm just giving nuts and bolts. So that's a nuts and bolt number one. Number two, if this was easy, it would have happened earlier, right? Yeah. So the fact that everybody's talked about it for a hundred years and there's this huge desire, but it hasn't happened, kind of tells you something. And so the first place that I would look is money. And it turns out it, go, it is going to cost an awful lot of money. Now, one person that we have to thank for the, this, for reminding us of this, is Alan Henderson, who gave a talk on this issue at that conference. And he spoke about needing whatever association, as you say, whatever association is going to take up the torch needs to understand that you don't just build a, an, a building, there's upkeep, right? So you don't just build a house, you build a house and then in perpetuity, there's upkeep. This is the same thing we faced when we founded PAVA. Everybody went, yeah, let's found an association. It's going to be great. And, within you know a week john nix and i were up to our eyeballs in reading about how you start an association and how much money you need um ten thousand dollars to start that's just right right off the starting gate so you got to have ten thousand dollars to start an association and then you have to think about what about in perpetuity will it last so there has to be a structure and a mechanism to make these systems last so to your question about certification, um, there's money that has to start the process. Then there has to be some kind of funding system that keeps it going for 50 to 100 years on, which means staff, because you have to hire a staff to process all of those certifications. And you have to, this is probably even more important, there has to be a staff to process those certifications um, staying uh, updated. So as any of our speech language pathology friends will tell you, tell us, they have to have a certain number of CEUs, continuing education units, as they go throughout their career. Um, and those are stipulated by OSHA, the American Speech he Language Hearing Association. And that, that arm of OSHA, that keeps track of those CEUs and issues them is huge. It's an office, it's a building, it's people, it's salaried people <laughs> with benefits. So suddenly, you know, this great idea becomes all of a sudden very freighted under that reality. And I've always said bravo to Alan Henderson, who is the CEO of Nats, for 
coming into, basically coming into our clubhouse and throwing a big bucket of cold ice water on this great idea. Um, but it's an important moment because we've studied it. We're about to study it again. There is now another PAVA subcommittee that has been appointed to study certification, and I'm on it. Uh, we are starting our work actually next week. And so um, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that it's going to be time to come to grips with these realities. We've had enough talking about the idea of it and is it a good or bad thing and do people deserve it or not? And you know, I think all of those questions have not only been raised, I think they've been answered. And, and I think they've been answered in a very positive way. There's a lot of yes in there. But then it comes down to the how, and then it comes down to the will. And really, this is going to be somebody's life work. And I should say somebody's plural. Several people are going to want to dedicate the rest of their professional life. Um, really, we're talking three to five to even 10 years of huge amounts of professional time. Um, unpaid for, purely volunteer, to put this structure in place and sell it to the membership and ensure that people will be willing to pay much larger membership fees in order for this to keep happening. Mm -hmm. And so it, the last thing I'll say, you know, because this is a huge topic, um, SLPs have no choice. So the minute that we take ourselves out of an artistic or educational setting and put ourselves into a medical setting, we are also in the, um, as they say, the mare's nest of health insurance. Oh, wow. And privacy issues and licensure. And it becomes this whole huge thing. And again, I ask myself, First of all, I am not a scientist. I am not uh, a medical professional. I'm not a therapist. I'm an artist. I teach singers how to sing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that is my world. And I do lots of other interesting things, but that's my home base. And I don't think that we should go forward with only enthusiasm. We have to start asking the hard questions, which I just listed, which were all financial and structural. But the third and deeper question is, what world do you want to live in? So I have lots of enthusiastic graduate students who come to USC to study, and they want to, they've quickly learned about uh, ecology and about the possibility of working in a medical setting, which is great if that's what they want to do. But I, I say you should go shadow somebody and see what their day is like. It, it's probably very different from what you envision. And I can tell you one thing, it's not going to involve high level discussions of Mozart and Verdi and all the great composers that we love to talk about. Um, it isn't. It's a medical setting. People are there for therapy. And so um, we have to know what it is we're wishing for. Ah, uh, gotcha. Right? Because if we get there and we get too invested and it's too late to pull out because we've already built half the edifice, Oh, it'll be really hard to tear it down, which is another thing that Alan Henderson brought up. He also brought up that it also costs money to take things apart, which we learned when we created PAVA. Again, when you have a 501c3 or c6 and you're registered with the federal government, you don't just go, you know what, we decided we're not going to do this anymore. You have to actually dismantle it. It's like getting a divorce. And, you know, divorces are, they cost money. Right. They're really more complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so that was a huge question. It it was, and I, I love the fact that we're beyond the the is this good or bad question into the nuts and bolts of what, yeah, what does should, it actually take. Yeah, and I that's should so address that because I did sidestep it. And I'll just say very simply, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course people want to be recognized for 
I don't want to say their accomplishments. They want to be recognized for taking the initiative and spending their resources of time and money, often away from friends and family, to invest in their own education and their own betterment within their field. Right. Yay. That's wonderful. We should all be doing that. Um, and so I think that the the impetus and the desire for certification is very real and it's based on very honest and well-meaning impulses that need to be honored. Mm -hmm. They really do. So I don't, so I'm not on the flip side saying, oh, get over it. This is silly. Um, because if it were, people wouldn't be going to huge amounts of debts to get graduate degrees. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I've brought up also in conversations because I've heard this. Oh, this is silly. We don't need this thing. And I think, well, then do you need your DMA? <laughs> would you like to put, would you like to offer that up? <laughs> right. you know? And people get suddenly very, it's like, well, no, I invested, you know, years of my time and my, well, exactly. And people also invest not on as huge a scale, but when they go and spend two weeks at the Summer of Ecology Institute, right. that's huge in resource um, investment. So I think it's going to be tricky to honor people's wishes, honor their enthusiasm, but also help people understand how complicated and expensive building the structure really could be. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's wonderful. I, um, I do have enormous amounts of enthusiasm and very little understanding of how it all works. So I, I'm very much appreciate you talking about this and laying out the reality of it too, because, um, part of my desire for these videos is to, um, get people involved in the conversation. There may be somebody who watches this video and says, oh, wait, I know how to do this, or um, I'd like to be involved in this, or I need a life's path. This might be the one that I choose, you know. Yeah. So yes. you... Um, exactly. In fact, let me just add to that. I want to say one other thing about that, because this is another sort of passion slash soapbox. Um, so speaking of professionalization, it's very common as people go through their professional lives and become recognized for their work. And as I try to mentor my grad students, earn, <laughs> you have to earn that respect by the hard work that you do. But eventually it happens and usually things start to fall into place and you get asked to sit on this or that committee. And especially if you do good work, um, it, that word gets around very quickly, right? It's like, who do I need? I need five people to do this subcommittee. We got to issue a report in six months. Who do I know that has these attributes, some of which should go without question? Are they going to actually read the documents that we put out? Are they going to offer good insight? And almost as importantly, are they going to be timely? Are they going to be that person that I have to go after all the time? Um, so as people go up through that trajectory, what I'm concerned about right now is that we are inculcating a new generation of leaders in whatever field we want to call this, vocal pedagogy or vocology, it doesn't really matter to me right now. Mm -hmm. But um, the leaders in this field, we are all a certain age and older. Mm -hmm. And so I've begun to talk about making sure that we're nurturing the younger people. And when I say that, I know that people have visions in their mind of my 20 something graduate students. And I, that's not what I'm thinking about. I'm not necessarily even thinking about the 30 year olds. I'm thinking about the 40 year olds mm. because I think that's always sort of the last generation in any professional pursuit. Um, and there are often very easy to understand reasons for that, which often have to do with the fact that your 40s are probably the pinnacle of when you're, if you've decided to raise a family, you've got kids, you've got aging parents, and you've got your own um, career taking off. And that, can, that, that decade for a lot of people, and again, I'm talking, it could be 35 to 45, wherever. 40 to 50, but in those years, you are at your absolute maxed out busiest. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I want to make sure that we offer platforms for people to come in. And so that is, you know, please send me your articles to have a guest article in your call in my column. Um, Please volunteer to be on a subcommittee for something. And don't wait to be asked, you know, put your hand in the air and say, I I don't, just like you said, I'm not sure I know about this, but I have a lot of enthusiasm and I'm an intelligent person I can read, right? <laughs> send, me the, send, me the, uh, send me the background information and I promise I'll be a good student and I'll read and I'll know what the issues are so that when we have our first meeting, I'll be able to participate. We, we've got to be thinking ahead, I think, in that regard. Yeah. And... And I think this is a lovely place to finish the interview in saying, number one, thank you again for your time. And two, I feel like this interview is as informative as it is a call to action. (laughs) Yes. So just to reiterate for anybody who's watching all the way to the end of this video, one, send Lynn your ideas for the mindful voice in the journal of singing and two, get involved, get involved in your professional organizations and start um, having a voice pun intended, right? Yeah, pun intended. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. yeah really and, and also remembering that um, don't just, uh, don't just put your hand in the air when you have a complaint. Yeah. You know, um, it's, it's, it's a well-known secret, by the way, that when people do that, you know, whoever's in charge says, great, how about you do that next? <laughs> how about you lead the charge on that? You know, that's, what, that's how I got my column, right? I put my hand in there and I said, I don't know why nobody's writing about brain science. It's so important. <laughs> and the next thing you know, how, would you like to do that? You know, uh, I'm so. glad you complained because it's really <laughs> wonderful. <so. laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's good so, to talk to you, Liz. Good yeah. luck with this project. It's a really important one, I think. Thank so. you so much. And as I have more and, and better questions, I hope that you'd be interested in having a conversation sometime in the future. Sure, I would be happy to. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Liz. Bye. 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 Bye